to unified conferencing.
to our OS. <laughs>
So uh, it's eight. So while these guys get their caffeine fix, uh, we'll begin. Uh, Furan is a very old heterocycle. Can the folks in Florida hear me? Okay. Good morning, guys. Uh, so it was isolated the first one back in the 1700s, which is actually, I mean, just to put it in perspective, Waller made urea in 1868 or so, and and so this is very ancient, ancient chemistry. The, uh, furans come from byproduct of, uh, you can get them from coal tar, you can get them from sugars decaying. So furans are what, what people would refer to today as a, a feedstock starting material. And in the case of drug discovery, you probably are not going to see them much beyond the fuse systems. So when we start talking about purines and quinolins and things like that, when you start putting and appending a furan onto one of those heterocycles, knowing this is important. So while Patrick will admit there are no furan syntheses going on at Pfizer probably at the moment, no, he agrees, it's probably uh, not inaccurate to say that there are furan pieces found throughout the deck. As long as they're attached to something which is electron deficient, it's fair game. <clears throat> so you're probably going to encounter furans more in total synthesis and uh, use as intermediates and the interesting oxidations they do. Thiophenes you're going to find more in drug discovery, and so I think that benzothiophenes, are, there are benzothiophenes that are commercial that people take. So there are several of them, actually. So they're less of a concern, although people usually also try to avoid those. Again, you need to know how to make the basic ring system in order to make the more complicated ones we'll talk about in a few weeks. So if you're worried that this has no pharmaceutical relevance, uh, don't worry, because you need this key component to understand how to make those more complicated ones with furans that are embedded within them. Okay, so let's start off with one of the first commercial drugs that had a furan embedded, and it's no longer on the market, but it was a, the equivalent of a blockbuster drug back when it was on the market, and it begins with uh, furfural alcohol, which is one of the cheapest things you can buy. And it begins with uh, a manic reaction. And so we need someone, I'm going to rely heavily on the furan team, obviously. We've got the furan and benzothiophene and thiophene team, Schwang, Sarah, and Zigi. And hopefully they, have, they are the experts today that can help us through all of this chemistry. So I'm going to do a manic reaction. I've got a few options for attack. And um, we can go... Two, three, or four. Any suggestions? Uh, maybe Sarah wants to start us off? All right, great. 
So our first adduct is that. And then when we treat this with HCl and the <clears throat> thioamine shown here, we get another strange adduct. Well, what's going to happen with HCl first in this mixture? Protonathiamine, ionize the alcohol. Protonathiamine, <coughs> ionize the alcohol. Sulfur. Hell, let's protonate all of them. Okay. And then we're going to go via the intermediate that uh, I guess Steve taught us about back in lecture one. Right? Great. Then you dump in that amine. That uh, great Michael acceptor addition elimination takes place, and you have you can look at the front page of your handout for the structure of ranadine. Now, <clears throat> you know, 30 years later, even you folks who are not medicinal chemistry veterans can identify the fact that having a furan and a nitro group probably not going to be the best drug, and indeed it was removed for toxicity reasons later on, but. This is history. You have to understand it. Okay, so how do you make furans? You know, unlike the other, all the other heterocycles that we'll talk about, such as when we talked about uh, pyrrole yesterday, uh, where there's a really nice logic to them and there's a lot of name reactions, that doesn't exist with furans. It's a hodgepodge mixture of things. So I've tried to summarize it uh, in terms of the, the go-to methods you're going to see. The first one is basically problem of the day number one from yesterday. 1,4 dicarbonyl logic. So we can use what we learned yesterday to derive a lot of furan syntheses. The same thing we talked about yesterday, where we have 1,4 dicarbonyls that you add an amine to and you make a pyrrol. Same thing. Just don't add the amine. Treat it with acid instead, and it will gracefully transform itself into a furan. So one example of a name reaction which takes advantage of this 1,4 dicarbonyl logic is the famous... Feist Panari synthesis, which takes a beta keto ester and a alpha halo carbonyl, uh, puts them together with a little bit of mild base, like pyridine is enough, and out pops a furanyl product. So maybe Schwang can tell us the first step. Well, I got a choice. I can either go here or I can go here. And uh, in <clears throat> alpha chlorous acid aldehyde, the carbonyl is extremely electrophilic. And uh, with a soft base like this, what you almost always see is attack at the carbonyl. And that will lead us to. That. Now, how do I finish it? Is by the way, is that a one four dicarbonyl? Uh, Tanner, is that a one four dicarbonyl? Not quite. Uh, Tucker, is it a one four dicarbonyl? It's not quite. With my stilted logic, it is right. We're at the we're at the right oxidation state, right? So, based on problem of the day number one from yesterday. I can say one, two, three, four. It is a one-four dicarbonyl because if I massage this oxidation state and just put it over here, that's a carbonyl, that's a carbonyl, it's one-four. So the way to think about one-four dicarbonyl logic is don't take, don't do a literal interpretation of it, right? Just like we, you, you mentioned diacetylene yesterday. That's not a one-four dicarbonyl in the literal sense, but it's an equivalent. So same thing here. This is a one-four dicarbonyl hiding. And so if in the enol form, this thing cyclizes on here, and then you lose water, there's your product. <clears throat> Do you want me to draw the enol form just to help?
questions? That's Feist Paneri. So you've got one four dicarbonyl logic that summarizes, we have summarized there probably 10 to 20,000 papers. No exaggeration. So if you see a new, new furan synthesis and you're not quite sure how it works, 90% of the time, look for the one four dicarbonyl equivalent and you'll find what they're doing. It works for almost everything, even benzofurans, as you'll see in a minute. Okay, the other way you'll see to make furans, that's pretty popular, is through cycloaddition. So, this is kind of a reminder, of, I think we talked about this from lecture one or two. Uh, <clears throat> how would you make this simpleton? Uh, Gigi, we need some help from the furan team. Okay. Oh, you want to use an oxazole, huh? <clears throat> well, if we use an oxazole, that's very clever. Uh, what you're going to need there is something like this. So, often people use oxazoles. It's not what they did, Gigi. They did something different for this particular example, but there's nothing wrong with your answer. The only issue is that <clears throat> now you have to make that oxazole, which is okay. We'll learn how to make oxazoles, and those are not, actually not so difficult to make. It's definitely a good answer. Is there another cycloaddition you could use for this? Sorry? And do the same 4 plus 2, drive it to completion by loss of ethylene or acetylene. Sure, that works too. And this is very, this is, I would think this is easier to make. You could, or, or, yeah, I wouldn't say buy, but we don't buy anything here. Uh, you could make this very easily, probably easier than that. Questions? Both of these answers are right. We'll see the oxazole trick again in a minute. So Gigi has prepared us well. Uh, so we need now several people to be involved in problem of the day number one. Uh, let's see. So do we have a volunteer? Maybe someone can just call out A, given what we've just talked about. So let's talk about that one, Hannah. In practice, they don't do that. Why might this reaction be less likely to work? Uh, it doesn't do so much that. What's another thing you can imagine? What's yeah, there's that. And even if it worked a little bit, you're not really getting that driving force of the acetylene loss because they're really both gases, and it's not. It just not match very well. Uh, can we can we use the Gigi trick? Oh, 
plus one. That will work. How about B? Steve, you want to give it a shot? This is exactly the way you should think. That's what we get, right? How do we make that? An electrophile on one side and then a on the other. That's it. So you could use that with the right base and get out the product. Doesn't matter which one of the tags, by the way. Uh, how would you avoid the... <clears throat> you know, it's actually more difficult to do Novenagles on alpha halo ketones. They're usually more... Uh, even if it goes to the first step, so even if it at attacks the carbonyl, the faster thing to happen then is just closure on the alpha chloride rather than loss of water to the Novenagle product. Um, and, yeah, that's... Probably right. Now, let's imagine you. Let's imagine you do get the Canovanago product. Is that the end of the road for you? Uh, What's that? That also goes forward. So it's not the end of the road for you. The key is just doing what Steve said. Look for the 1,4-dicarbonyl, because that's going to be your go-to logic, always, except in the case of strange ones. If you do the 1,4-dicarbonyl and you don't get simplification, then think cycloaddition. That's it. Those, all the problems are going to be that. There'll be some exceptions, and we'll talk about those in a minute. How about this one? Uh, let's see. Uh, how about Jess? I can't hear you. What? Um, well, Palnor involves adding uh, an amine, but I know your logic. What is the Palnor starting material? Um, uh huh. Yes. So we're just going to use the Steve maneuver every time. How do we make that? You can do stetter if you want to the alpha beta unsaturated system here. So you could cut here, Dongman suggests. Uh, you could also use the thing that we just learned before and just take a ketone, deprotonate it, and then the alpha halo ketone here. Right? Once you get to 1,4 dicarbonyl city, then you go to Shenby's class and Boger's class. It's just basic organic chemistry, right? Then you, there's no more heterocycles. So it's almost, it's not, I'm deferring the responsibility to the other teachers at the institute. After you get the 1,4-dot carbonyl, it's not my problem. Okay? If you don't know it, go complain to them. D is a little bit tricky, or maybe not. Uh, sorry, can, what do you say, Vincent? Or Nick? Cycle addition to Cycloaddition. Cycloaddition to what? <coughs> to just furan. And then. Uh, so furan with itself? No, no, no. So furan with uh, may, maybe an acetylene. Um, let's go with malic and hydride to make our life a little easier. And then what? Why do you do that? Why can't you just take furin and brominate it? Yeah, and then over a brominate, it'll go in the you know uh, wrong position. 
it's going to be a, a bit of a problem. So the trick, great, Nick. The trick here is protect the C2 position by cycloadding. Then you can have your way with the 3, 4 position of the furan. And then, when you're done doing whatever you want to do with it, release it again, and you get out your product. Sneaky, huh? Is there an alternative way? Is there an alternative way? That's actually um, a good question. There are companies looking into that now. It's not so simple. There are alternative ways that involve um, various expensive transition metal uh, reagents and... Uh, but it is, an, it is a bit of an unsolved problem. Some people will take, you could take ferroic acid, you could do halogenation of ferroic acid adjacent, and then you could decarboxylate, but it's not very, you know, the industrial way of making it is still that. Have people tried, like, a dibromo um, acetaldehyde and acetaldehyde? Would that work? The problem with those, it's, those compounds are super unwieldy on scale. And... Furan is free, molecular hydride is free, bromine is free, heat is also pretty inexpensive. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so if, if, you, um, if you try to beat it from a pure, pure cost analysis, that's why this still wins on scale. How about E, which is a, a Abbott compound or AbbVie compound? And notice this one is a benzofuran. So a Lorac is a great suggestion, but what is the intermediate? The Lorac gives you what intermediate, Saul? It, it gives you the final validated species. No, no, give me be before that. What? 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 Two. Yeah, between those two. You have oxidative addition of palladium. No, 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 no. You're going to take iodophenol and you're going to react it with what? Alkyne. Alkyne, okay. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? What happened? I just didn't I just know why you didn't before and I answered after. <laughs> All right, so is this a 1,4 dicarbonyl? Sure is. So you could derive the Lorac benzofuran synthesis even if you didn't know any of it, right? Because you would say, well, I know that I can do all sorts of CC bond formation from that. What do I need to put there for it to close? People have all sorts of derivations of this. So you can put it all of them there and then add an oxidant. You can even treat this with base and then close it to give things here. So if you take the intermediate, make it carefully protected, and then use a different condition like NBS or NIS, you can get the thing to cyclize to give a halogen there. I mean, I suppose I could give you PowerPoint full of 40, 50, 60 examples of that. And no matter how much caffeine you would have, you wouldn't be able to stay awake for it. But this is sort of representative of a large body of literature. That's probably the best way to make benzofurans. We're going to talk about two more ways in a minute, so don't worry. But that's the one that's the go-to for benzofurans. Okay? How about F? Can we use the Steve... Analysis for this one? Uh, Chang, you want to use Steve analysis? Okay. with that? Yeah, you, you've got uh, two possible 1,4 dicarbonyls here, and it's very likely that the two carbonyls that you want to cyclize, namely this one and this one, are not going to be the one that cyclize. So you have a bit of a problem, don't you? If 1,4 dicarbonyl doesn't work for you, then what can you do? 
Yeah. So then we can use the GG maneuver again. Very easy to make. And you're done. Lose benzonitrile. This part is expunged and replaced with this part via the same mechanism we saw here. No, there's not. And so that's the why they put the phenyl group there. That controls the regiochemistry to give you the right one. I, I, I have seen that. People prefer the phenyl just because it gives it a little more juice, a little more molecular weight, easier to handle. They're easier to make. But I think the methyl, I think the methyl would work as well. How about G? I can't hear you, Nick. Is that what you want? Uh, yeah. Looks good to me. Again, 1 4 dicarbonyl logic. So you, you could easily derive your own vice binari without learning that annoying name reaction. Okay, as I promised you, everything is going to be infused with radio labeling. One reason to be annoying, and the second reason that you may, you may, one of you may thank me one day when you become a radio chemist. Okay, so we need to make this O18 label furan. Suggestions? I can't, can't hear you. We all, we all, we really only have like heavy water to work with, right? Yeah, we're pretty much, you know, you can get O18 gas. Okay. Mm, not, not so easy though. Um, but I think that, as we wrote yesterday, that the best O18 source is going to be water, yeah. as you said. It's like you like a Von Grock foundation at some point to install that. So breaking it down to a one for dicarbonyl and then breaking that further down to something that can be oxidized. You want that? You want that? Yeah. And, and then, where does the O18 come from? I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot. From the CO. Oh, that... If you can avoid using CO labeled at auction with the 18, that's going to be expensive. You're not going to enjoy doing that. And the other thing that's problematic with this strategy is, let's imagine you, you, you put the O18 here. Uh, for, first, before we even get to there, you, you're going to have a problem getting this to stay out of conjugation and not just immediately move in. So that's an issue. Um, what, what do you think is maybe a problem with that guy as well? Alcohol condensation. Alcohol condensation. <clears throat> Other suggestions? Cyclohexanone and Bilsmeyer reagent, and then heavy water. What does cyclohexanone and the Bilsmeyer reagent give?
How does that work? Let's first figure out this mechanism so everybody's on the page. Because we're going to need this chemistry in just a minute, so this is not a waste of your time. Then what? Now what? Chloride attacks the ketone. <clears throat> Can you imagine what what is this really? What is this thing? Isn't it just a vanilligous acid? You know, when I see a species like this, in my head, all I see is this. This carbonyl is this. Okay? And so I should be able to use the Vilsmeyer reagent through the same mechanism to turn that into the chloride, which after hydrolysis, you lose dimethylamine, and that's the product. So a vanilligous acid chloride. So great. We're going to need those things later on when we talk about thiophenes. So hold that thought. We don't have to do the mechanism of that anymore. Great. Thanks, Steve. Now we have that. What are we going to do with that? I'm having a hard time getting to that furan you wanted to get. I do appreciate the Vilsmeyer mechanism, though. So Saul's modification of Steve's suggestion is to instead get that through the use of Vilsmeyer esque reagent. And then what do you want to do? Heavy water on vinyl well, but <clears throat> oh, I where's I'm um, one carbon short. How do you suggest we install that one carbon? How do you want to append it? Oh, I guess it needs to be onto the carbonyl. Kind so of. It just be nucleophilic if it's not too What what kind of nucleophilic? I mean, wait. Uh, what do you want to do? Just add methyl manganese and bromide? Uh, no, That's well, not going to be such a good day for me. Yeah, well, it needs to be a formal methyl manganese equivalent. But you have a vanillic acid Yeah, that's going to be a problem. And if you start making, if you just, you know, if you hydrolyze this with heavy water, you're going to just get that. And then you're going to have selectivity issues. So the way they actually did this is kind of creative. And I'm kind of happy nobody got it. So they just made that guy. Then with PPTS and O18 water, very mild conditions that would not deprotect the glycol, they got their label. Then they treat this with a chorioilid. And when you treat that with a little bit of acid and water, uh, that deprotects.
water adds in at the, here the tertiary cation. That then cyclizes on here. This 18 water stays put, does the attacking, and then you lose water and you get out the product. Pretty spiffy. You know, radiochemists, they are very clever folks. PPTS, just very mild acid, and water, and 18 water. So the it did not deprotect. Stays it stays intact. The ketal stays there, exactly. That's the trick. Okay. If you're not sick of radio labeling, that's great, because there's two more examples for you. Let's take a look at this top one here. How do we make this one? Can we do Lorac? What? No? Oh, okay. And is there another idea? Any uh, suggestions here, Zhang? Any thoughts at all on bonds that might be logical to break? Too many carbons, don't I? Sorry. <clears throat> and then I guess I'll disconnect the alpha carbon to the arrow wave. Here? this? Yeah, so maybe the two X's can be different uh, coupling groups to guess them too. <sighs> okay. Just the camera. Um, it, it, this is certainly reasonable. The only problem is, one thing is you're doing a lot of steps with radio labeled material. So every time we made this disconnection, <clears throat> Zhang, you're, you're carrying with you quite a waste stream. Every step needs to be done in a special lab. You still have to make the radio labeled material. You haven't done it at a late stage. While being a viable disconnection, it's a terrible radio synthesis. But it's great thinking. Any other ideas? What's the problem with that strategy? How do I get my C14 acetylene labeled right there, and rather than a mixture? Or just dye? Because you can get dye labeled acetylene, but mono, how are you going to control which side gets up? So remember, the position could also matter for the, you can't just throw it anywhere you want. So one disconnection we haven't talked about, which is a good way to talk about benzofurans, is the 2-3 disconnection. Remember, if we just go back to regular sort of logic,
That should be a very easy disconnection, right? And then disconnect here. Now all you need to get in your hands is this, which is just a simple frito crafts reaction, plus that, which is a two-carbon radial label. It's going to be expensive, but not prohib prohibitively so. How would you make this one labeled? We could use the same logic, couldn't we? Instead, <coughs> just derive it from here. So you could easily make that one through a Grignard, CO2, and then add phenyl to that after wine rep or whatever, followed by cyclization. So this strategy can be used to make either labeled one, the two or the three. This strategy only works with electron withdrawing groups at C2, obviously. So if we don't have an electron withdrawing group at C2 and we need to make that radial label thing, the strategy is a little bit different. And your, will your Laroque work for this? It, it could, but you just need a way of very deftly getting the right label at that carbon, which can sometimes be challenging. So the way people address this is by using a different benzofurane synthesis that starts from Imagine how this works. Heat it up, little base. You'll get isomerization, 3-3, three, three, reclosure, and uh, you're done. Does that not count as kind of an exotic radio label? Well, there's nothing exotic about making this compound radio label. We only care about we only care about how we get that. This is just one step. Just take this guy, condense it here, heat it up, and you're there. So that's one, we followed the, close to one step with hot material is what you want to do. So you may, you've got to get this hot material, which you can probably get, again, in one step, because this is either carbon monoxide or it is CO2, addition, addition. You don't like that? It's true. I mean, you know, you, you, it's going to take you two steps to make that, but I guess that's what, a challenging what position. What is considered to be too many steps or a lot of steps? Well, it, it's all context dependent. Sure. Some compounds are simply not going to be makeable in one step. <laughs> and so w then what you have to do in your sort of uh, stra strategy triaging tree is write all the disconnections and then choose the one with the minimum number of steps and easiest starting material. So I'm basing my retrosynthesis on CO2, as we talked about yesterday. And I, can, I know I can get CO2 to, be, you know, to turn into a ketone very easily. In fact, if you check the Cambridge Isotope Lab catalog, you'll find benzoyl chloride can be had, C14 label. But if you don't have that access to that, you know you can make benzoyl chloride. Just take phenyl Grignard, CO2, then treat the crude mixture with COCl2, you'll get the acid chloride, and then take that and add in another Grignard. So it could be telescope. Yeah, so you quench it with a wine wrap and then add in so it's two steps. Right. I mean, this is a challenge of radiochemistry. <clears throat> so it's not uh, you know, from a radiochemical perspective, it's not ideal. But but making that benzofurane just from CO two and in one step is not so I mean that's as straightforward as it gets. Yeah, if you really want one like step, you, and that's right. Then you, you in, in Kiri's class, he's teaching you a hundred ways of doing this kind of thing. So if you if you search one pot, uh, one pot ketone synthesis from CO with some sort of palladium reagent, I'm sure this is known. Yeah. 
That's right. Probably the alkyl zinc, CO, and phenyl iodide. And some palladium catalyst will give you that compound in one step. And that's what a radiochemist would do. They'd find the cheapest and fastest way, and CO is not that bad, nor is CO2, considering C14. Everything C14 is expensive. Right, Ken? Yeah. But it's a good, this is a good discussion to have. What scale do radiochemists usually need to operate on? Tiny. So you don't need much. You, 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 usually you give back to your biologist, you know, 10 megs is enough. That's it. They get all the data they need. They feed it into a rat, check the urine or whatever they do with it, and then say, okay, it's here or that, whatever. They, you know, the met, met stab profile is very easy to figure out. You're not going to be dosing these things in humans. In the case where you do F18, you will dose in a human, but again, you need like, you know, not an animal, but it's a very, very small amount. And often you're dosing someone with a mixture of F18 and 19, but you only need a little bit because the technique is so sensitive. Same with carbon-11. You'll dose that into a person as well, but it's mostly carbon-12, just a tiny bit of carbon-11. And But it's so sensitive, the technique. If your sample is 1% or 2% C11, that may be enough for the machine to pick up where it went in the body. Great. Any other questions? Well, that's furans and benzofurans, folks. That's everything you need to know uh, from a big picture standpoint that'll get you through probably 90% of the literature and any kind of interview question they'll throw you at you. So let's talk about thiophenes, a little bit more uh, useful. And we can have a little more fun with thiophenes. So the go-to methods are, again, 1,4-dicarbonyl. If you know how to make a 1,4-dicarbonyl, and you can add in some losses in the reagent or something similar to that, P2S5, and you can thiolate one of those carbonyls or both, it will snap shut to a thiophene. We can use Tucker's logic again, diacetylene, treated with H2S, out pops, out pops thiophene. We can use cycloaddition, this time instead of an oxazole, a thiazole, but this is rarely employed because the temperatures are much higher. People often don't want to go to 340 degrees. The most popular ways of making thiophenes from scratch, and the way we're going to see over and over again from now until even the final lecture of this class, is going to be Feiselman and Gewald. Those two are essential that you remember. And they're really easy. They're super intuitive. So to <clears throat> exemplify the Feiselman, let's talk about problem of the day number two. So... Uh, Anybody interested in drawing? Sarah has made eye contact, which is a grave error if you're stirring the problem of the day. Uh, and as a member of the uh, Thiophene team, she is uh, well prepared for this problem. So let's see the mechanism. Uh -uh. Super.
Okay, now it looks like Sarah's at the end of the papyrine step. You can use two fingers to go down. So now we need to do something with that methoxide. Okay. Brilliant. How do we finish it? Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. <coughs> Everybody see that? That's Faiselman. <clears throat> there are many Faiselman equivalents, tons of them. You're going to see them a lot. So uh, this type of phenomenon, where you have this alpha electron withdrawing group with a thiol attached, can add into all sorts of electrophiles. For example, how would we make that using what Steve taught us earlier? What did Steve teach us? What's that? Oh, sorry, that's not aromatic. Uh, just an olive in there. And they're done. Brilliant. <clears throat> this works so well because sulfur, of course, has a, a real desire to add in a soft fashion in a Michael addition, followed by elimination of the chloro and then immediate, immediate cyclization. And you get out your product. So this would be E, or in the case where this is R, you could put SH here. That's fine too, whatever you want. Okay, so here is one of our first examples of a ring system which you have never seen before. A lanzapine, which I think is for like depression or schizophrenia or something. It's a really uh, good selling drug. So there's a lot of people that take this stuff, and it helps people apparently. 
So we need some thoughts in problem of the day, and we don't even necessarily need the iPad. We just need some somebody to help us think through what, how we conceptualize the synthesis of this type of tricyclic heterocycle. Looks like Max is raring to help us on olanzapine. Thanks for volunteering. Max number two. <laughs> because you're always sitting in the second row. So. Oh, okay. um, I would do a if you move to the front row, we'll have Max and Max Prime. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. What are you What are you going to do? I would do a gawal to make C. You would do a gawal to make C. Just teach us for a moment when you say you would do a gawal to make C. Uh, what What does the C look like that you want to make? Like this? Yeah. Uh, uh, now, let, let me ask you a question here, Max, since we've engaged you on this problem. This carbon here, uh, that, that carbon, when you've got like a, an amino position at that, what did we learn is a good signaling element for that? Nitrile. So we could have E here. You certainly could get to the end with E. But even better would be that. And we'll show you how this works later. But, and then, so you've got building block C. Yeah. Help us with building block A. Um, for A, I would choose like some or some sort of N aeration on the halo. Yeah. That sounds great. And so if we recapitulate the components, that is going to couple to here, and this is going to couple to here. Yes? Yeah. So now let's make Max's thiophene. Uh, he said he wants to use Gewald. What do we do when we see that? The same thing we did over there. Tanner, what do we do? No, no, no. We, when we have a carbon here that's got an amino on it, adjacent to a header atom. Draw an addition to a nitrile. Well, yeah, let's just do that. So we're going to derive the Gewald, even if you don't know what the Gewald is. How do you like that? We have the right carbon count? We sure do. So if we can make this thing, we're home free, aren't we? Is there a good way to make that? That's not, uh, um, let, let, let's try, so you had, let, let's try that. You had, to make this? Yeah, well, no, it was uh, different than that. Chloroacetone. Yeah. Plus? And the hope there was that you were going to make? No, just the C alkylation. And then some sort of source to get it to the cycle. And then a sulfur source is uh, unfortunately the wrong oxidation state, I think. Uh, or no, it's, it is right. You've got, you've got, that's fine. So treat that with Lawson's reagent and then 
let's keep that there in the hopper. Let's keep it. And let's compare it to the alternative uh, real Gowald. Is there a good electrophilic source of sulfur out there? What's that? Lawson is a good way of taking a carbonyl and converting it to sulfur, but it's essentially a net nucleophilic and then elimination process. So I'm not sure I would regard it as really a electrophilic source in the sense that you can't really take an enolate, treat it with Lawson, and get just SH there. So we have a. Is there a good reagent that exists to do that? Disulfide. What? Disulfide. Disulfide has a baggage of other things. Sulfur? Tucker to the rescue. Yeah, this nice yellow powder, it's not very smelly, it's called sulfur. Actually really cheap and um, really convenient. What do you think of that, Max? You like? Because all I have to do is take these two components together, mix them with methoxide. This is going to rapidly give you that. And then the only electrophilic, uh, the only acidic position is this one, which will immediately deprotonate, capture sulfur. And then as soon as it captures sulfur, before it can do anything, it's going to immediately cyclides to give you the max thiophene. Are we happy with that? All right, how do we finish it? So now we've got max thiophene. We add it in an SNAR fashion to that. We have forged that bond. Now all we need to do to close this is treat it with some reducing agent, like tin chloride or iron filings, whatever. The nitro group turns into an amine. And the aniline engages the nitrile to give you NH2 here. And when you treat that with N-methylpipirazine and heat and acid, that amidine can exchange with ammonia to give you the desired product. That's process scale, obviously. A medicinal chemist would do what Max originally said and maybe go for the ester here so that you could have the amide treated with PLCL3 and then add in nucleophiles all day. But this is the way they do it on metric ton scale. That's Gewald. Questions? <coughs> all you have to remember with Gewald is you got a sulfur source and you got a nitrile. That nitrile is going to be the amino part of the amino furan, uh, of the amino thiophene. Okay, how about problem of the day number four? Problem of the day number four provi provides uh, three little case studies in thiophene synthesis that use everything we've just talked about. Any thoughts there, Vincent? You know, you'll, you'll never go wrong with just as your backup idea, just thinking about that, and then take that guy and treat with Lawson. Okay. Any other ideas? Dong Min, any idea? Okay. 
Well, another alternative to all these 1,4 dicarbonyls, and, and this is more of a, um, when you actually go to the hood kind of idea, medicinal chemists love Feiselman because you don't need losses as a reagent. And they love Vilsmeyer, as we learned before. So you can easily decarboxylate that if you want. And this just comes from that, which we know comes from the corresponding ketone. So you, it's easy to make libraries of ketones, easier to spray Vilsmeyer on all of them, and then immediately work them up with that, and then decarboxylate. Easier to do that than take a bunch of ketones, alkylate them with the alpha bromo or alpha chloro acid aldehyde, and then hope and pray it doesn't cyclize to a furan, bless you, while you run for your bottle of Lawson's reagent, which is a pain. So I suppose on a test, we couldn't necessarily take credit off because it's sort of paper on paper it's right. But boy, if you can go into an interview and show them that, you're pretty much, you'll get the job. How about this one? <clears throat> Is there a logical MedChem-like disconnection we can immediately make on this compound? What? What do you say, Nick? Let's just put metal here because it can be whatever you want. Grignard, Nagishi, doesn't matter. How do we make that thing? Which one? The, uh, the top one. The Furan, we already learned how to make back over there. Problem of the day number one, A, we learned how to make that. So now we, all we need to know how to do is make that thiophene on the top. Any thoughts? Uh, Feiselman sounds good. Treat this with dry HCl, it will give you that, or SOCl2, or oxalyl chloride, or Vilsmeyer reagent. Whatever you like to chlorinate an acid to an acid chloride, you can use here, okay? Yeah, what do you say there? Can we, can we do the same thing as we did in previous example, like starting from the monogus acid chloride and then just like putting the This is the vanillic acid chloride. But when we close, we need an extra oxidation state here. So when we close, we're going to get OH, and then we triplate it. If we do what we did before, we'll, we won't, we'll, we'll be missing that. So the reason I use this oxidation state is because I need oxygen here that I'm going to triflate and then use in the cross coupling. So the point here is that Feisselman can be used to give you whatever oxidation state you want, H or O. And then the O can be triflated, and you can cross couple all day. How about this one? A couple ways of making this one. Tucker, what are you thinking? Just go back retrosynthetically. What do you want? What's the intermediate you want to go to? So pulling off, uh, so opening up into a biofine with a ended sulfuride. So 
So Feiselman would give you something like this. Yeah. And then we need to take that E and convert it into that. That's a little steppy. How about the fallback strategy? When in doubt, <laughs> right? So on a test or an interview and they show you some thiophene, the first thing you should run through your head is quickly, does the 1,4-dicarbonyl get me there in a logical and practical way? And if it's iffy, then think about Feiselman. And if it gets really difficult, think about cycloaddition. But most problems that they're going to throw at you when you go to these companies are going to be solvable through Gewald or Feiselman or 1,4-dicarbonyl. So if we do this... And the nice thing about that is you can just stutter your way to victory. Like a champ. You don't like it, Hannah. You like it. Okay. I was just Just uh, Eshin Moser salt with uh, cyclaxanone. <clears throat> Other questions? Okay, we, we are uh, in the home stretch for thiophenes, we, and we're, we're right on time. Hey, Florida, uh, can you hear us? Because I can't see you on the screen anymore. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, great. Florida, problem of the day number five is going to be yours. Just to give you fair warning. We're not there yet, though. So just so you know, I'm going to be calling on you in a few minutes. Let's talk about Evista. Not, not Evista, but rather Silphiofam. We'll get to Evista in just a moment. Silphiofam is an agrochemical agent that is used on uh, metric ton scale for keeping fungus from eating uh, the plants that produce seeds. And so you normally think about pharma, but there's a lot of companies that you might interview for, like Dow, BASF, DuPont, uh, Syngenta, um, Monsanto, that you, they're going to want a different retrosynthesis altogether. And the success of your career in an agrochemical industry is going to be directly proportional to how cheap the thing is. Because farmers don't want to pay more than like a penny at Home Depot for a gram of the stuff they buy. So we're talking about giving people buckets of things. So consulting with them is very difficult because almost anything you start from, even fire is expensive for them. It's like, it's frustrating, okay? So when you think about an ag agent, it's all about the chemistry. Chemistry first leads the medicinal chemistry. You're not going to see the incorporation of propellants into an ag agent. Never going to happen, ever. Okay, so silthiofam, interesting little thiophene that's got a TMS group on it. I mean, the extra problem of agrochemical agents is even harder than what a medicinal chemist does because you have to worry that the thing is not going to be toxic, that it's not going to kill the other ecosystem that's there, and that it'll biodegrade, and it has to be free. So if you want a good challenge, you should think about those companies as well when you interview. All right, so the MedChem route to silthiofam is shown here as well as the process, and we'll compare and contrast those. It uses, as its first step, a Gewald-type synthesis. So the first step we already learned, and that is, I mean, we learned it from Max. So let's just draw. And uh, there are two isomers formed after we treat this with the, the sulfur can attack from two spots. So you can have sulfur here, or you can have sulfur here. And one of these is going to give you the right one. So if this one cyclizes on here, go ahead and draw that product in your head before I draw it out. I don't want to spoon feed you. That one. 
The other one gives the other isomer. It's the minor component, and med chemists don't care. Even in ag, it's fine. When we take this guy and treat it with uh, a Sandmeyer-like condition, and then uh, copper bromide, the product is what, Hannah? Great. And then when we take this compound and we treat it with hydroxide to hydrolyze the ester to the acid, we treat it with excess bule and TMS chloride. The carboxylate does a halogen metal exchange, quenches with TMS. We make the acid chloride, and then we quench with alumine. That's silthiofam. Now, the process chemists get this problem, and they say, we can't do pretty much any of this. We can't do it. First, can't deal with the mixture. Second, Sandmeyer on metric ton scale is too expensive for us. So we need a totally different way. <clears throat> so what they do to avoid the regiochemical quandary is they generate this thing in C2 from that. Treated with one equivalent of fresh or dry, super nice sodium sulfides, NASH, gives you this compound, which is then mixed with this <coughs> acrylate derivative, which is extremely inexpensive. And we can do what Sarah did before in that problem of the day to derive the intermediate. So go ahead and draw it. Don't wait for me to draw it. And that gives you that. <clears throat> now, they're taking advantage of what we learned in lecture three. The med chemists just want a quick way to do med, uh, SAR. The process chemists don't need to do SAR. So they treat this with lithium hydroxide. They get the carboxylate. Our carboxylate is a decent directing group. And on top of that, there's only one position. And on top of that, the C2 position of a thiophene is awesome for CHC protonation, as we learned already. And so they just go from the CH to the TMS to get this crystalline material as a salt. Acid chloride, alumine, done. Happy? So when I draw this intermediate here, it can be SR is the way you would draw it based on Sarah's problem of the day. But in reality, what actually happens is it stops at the methoxy. So it adds in as a methoxy, it then does the Diekmann, and then you lose methoxide. But if you were to draw on a test, I think you're going to do it twice. There's no problem with that. That would be the mechanism we, draw, we would draw based on what Sarah drew up before, right? But you don't need to do that. They, they don't observe it. They observe the methoxy adduct. Okay? Let's talk about a VISTA. A VISTA is used for osteoporosis. It's a uh, selective estrogen reuptake inhibitor. And actually, somebody's dad, I won't call him out, worked on these types of compounds for many years at Lilly. <clears throat> How do we make benzothiophenes? Any suggestions here? First, let's think about the VISTA core and the groups that we can immediately remove from the beginning. Give me a disconnection. Let's go back here and say two, three, four, five... Schwang, any ideas? Aha! Can you do the alkyne? So the alkyne approach
That's what you want, Chuang? Where's the, uh, let's see. Where are the Engel Lucas and Elena? Are you comfortable with that reaction? Palladium. Why not, Elena? Yeah, that free thial and the palladium are not going to play nice. And probably what's going to happen is that thial is just going to add in Michael addition straight away, and that's going to be the end of the day. Um, so probably not going to be the best way. They, they don't make it this way. I don't, haven't seen people make benzothiophenes using laroc like disconnections, even though they're, they're tempting to use them. Is there a group on Avista we can just remove right away? Let's do that. Let's just do Friedel Crafts. And then how do we make that? Well, can we just do this? Tree with acid? Max, you like that, right? It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Those thioaldehydes are not going to be so stable. So the way they do it instead... is by using a name reaction called the Bischler. When you treat this thing with acid, it closes to give you the C3 arrow, and then that thiorinium ion undergoes a 1,2 phenonium shift. And that's how you get selective C2, the Bischler thiophene, benzothiophene synthesis. You know, there's another way to do this. And if you're more on the med chem side and you say, you know, Phil, I just don't like that because it doesn't give me the optionality to control my AR1. All I can do is explore 50,000 Friedel crafts, but what if I want to explore 50,000 AR1s at the end of my synthesis? What's my option then? Are you out of luck? No. So the other way of doing this is by, uh, you don't need the iodide there. Is by taking this anion, so you lithiate the thio-DMF, it adds into the aldehyde, You treat this thing with methane sulfonic acid, and it closes to this strange creature. Now, the advantage of dealing with this is that I can now Friedel craft my way to success. So I can Friedel craft here, and I can add any Grignard I want here, and it does addition elimination. So there's your optionality if you want to install make a library around AR prime, you go through the deprotonated thio-DMF. If you want to make a library around AR, you go through the Bischler synthesis. Questions? <clears throat> How do we make that radio label benzothiophene on the bottom there? Quick suggestion? This one you might be able to call out. Max? The radio labeled aldehyde? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, if I use the radio label iodide. Uh, 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 oh, uh, I missed that word. That was, never well, but this starting material is right. That's correct. Get me home from there. Except I need a little bit something else on there. Can you put something else on there?
So in the interest of time, we need that. And this can come from And I can take that with copper cyanide, labeled cyanide, C14, then dibol, you get the aldehyde, and then one, step, one pot, alkylate close. So how many radio steps is that? We've got the sheriff of radio labeling in front here, Hannah, and uh, we need to make sure we have, have too many steps. So we'll, we'll take that one step, dibol, two step, and then immediately dump in your alpha bromo, so that's three set. Not too bad. What if gives you mixture? Oh, you don't care. You're a radio labeling person. So if the yield is 10%, it doesn't matter. You take it and celebrate. So that's the other thing radio labeling people don't care about is yield. No, 20, 30%. That's no, all fine. You just need 10 MIGs and you're never going to do it again. Right? It's one shot and you're done. All right, in the final five minutes here, we need help from Florida who have had ample time to think about problem of the day number five. So the problem number five asks the question, please make biotin, super important reagent. Anybody who's in chemical biology, looks like we don't have, oh, yeah, we have Zoe. Uh, anybody who's in chemical biology probably cares about this. You eat it all the time. It's a food, it's in your food. I mean, biotin, you know, it's everywhere. Uh, Florida, any suggestions for a thiophene-based starting material for uh, what do, what is the structure of A? Do you think? Well, I can't hear you. Sorry. Oh, I was thinking of removing the carbonyl from the urea portion, so it would be a diamino thiophene. And what do you want to put here? Uh, I don't know. Just alkylate it. Yeah. And Perfect. So the, the answer would be just, you know, there's no reason to remove that because we treat that with phosgene and you'll get that. <clears throat> there have been dozens of, at least 30 syntheses. There's a chem review on syntheses of biotin. There's no way for me to go through all the biotin syntheses in this room. I've only got three minutes left, folks. So... Uh, I suggest if you're really interested in the synthesis of biotin, you look at that chem review. Here are a couple of interesting examples, though, that um, we'll go through with uh, high speed. This is a 1945 synthesis, and it's a ring synthesis. We'll do two of the ring synthesis, and then we'll do uh, one that starts from thiophene. So... <clears throat> First, you treat this with sodium hydroxide. Remember, this is back in 1945. So the first thing we're going to do here is just add in. And then after you treat this with ethanol and acid, it's going to transesterify everything. And then you treat that with ethoxide. And the ethoxide has got to do something. And looks like we've got groups here that could be attacked. So we could just we've got two options here.
Okay, great. And here's five. Four, three, two, one. And at the four position, two ET. Great. Now when we treat this with hydroxylamine and then acid, something awesome happens. So the first thing that we do is make the corresponding oxime. And when we treat that with acid, what do you think happens? Well, I'll save you some time. The product is that. Another trick we learned last time was that you can buy your oxidation. It's much more efficient than oxidizing later. Hydroxylamine has in it the oxidation state we need. So if we treat this with acid, this oxidation state gets transferred to the ring. So you can draw the enol form here, but this oxidation by tautomerization can be kicked out water, and that's how you get your arom fully aromatic compound as the amine. Oh, sorry. I think so. Okay, so that's 1945. Taking this compound forward, then all you have to do is a courteous rearrangement, and we are at A. <clears throat> this one is the same type of story. Uh, for lack of time, we probably don't have time to go through it now, but um, you can imagine what happens here. The components, this is your anion that's going to be deprotonated. It's then going to add into this one, which will then alkylate, and then you cyclize. Where you can draw the product of that. And then finally, in the last 30 seconds or so, we need to go from a thiophene. The Friedel-Crafts takes place at the position you would imagine, at C2. We do a Wolf-Kishner to delete this carbonyl. We then treat that with SOCO2 and uh, tin chloride, which affects a intramolecular friedel crafts. And now, again, hydroxylamine goes in, Beckman rearrangement. And look, I have my amino. Now, in order to get the right positionality of the remaining amine, I first treat with bromine. Bromine goes there. I nitrate. Nitro goes here. And then following that, I open up the lactam with strong HCl. I reduce uh, with tin. That takes down the nitro. It also expunges the bromo. And then finally, phosgene gets us to the product. So that's a sort of whirlwind, three different approaches to biotin <clears throat> for ring synthesis, ring substitution. And if you want to see the 36 other syntheses that are out there, check out the chem review. Okay, so that's thiophenes. Next week, you'll have a review session where I think the TAs, uh, David and Yuzuru, are going to focus on the most confusing aspects of everything I talked about so far. Bring your questions. If you have things that have been generally bothering you, confusing, whatever, now is the time to catch up on that because it's only going to get more difficult. So you have a week to decompress, talk to the TAs, and get ready for the following week of class. Okay, have fun, guys.
puts all the stuff I can put in the trying to clean up the stuff. I mean,